Brighton. We're going to bring you some uh, reaction from the Brighton game yesterday. Uh, I suppose I should really call it the City game. Um, but uh, Brian Kerr was on commentary duty uh, alongside Stephen Doyle. We'll bring you that in a couple of minutes' time. In the meantime, uh, Nathan Murphy, good morning to you. How are you doing? You were also at Anfield yesterday. I certainly was. How's it going? Good, yeah. I was listening on the radio um, in that first half when that surge of noise came through and you threw to Stephen in the expectation that there'd been a goal because otherwise, <laughs> what the hell was going on? And Stephen's like, I don't really know why everybody's... Um, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, there was this uh, crazy five or six minutes where Anfield just erupted and suddenly everybody around us, because we're sitting right in front of a large group of Liverpool supporters, they all start celebrating. They start looking at us to see what we know. I'm not hearing anything. I'm shouting back at my producer, what's going on? And he's like, I'm not hearing anything. And it turns out uh, that the Wolves supporters were just taking the pace oh. and that they would start celebrating every so often. The Liverpool supporters, so they're camped down in the Anfield Road end in a little corner, but there's Liverpool supporters above them. There's Liverpool supporters beside them. Obviously, when they start cheering, all the Liverpool fans start cheering. It's like this Mexican wave of noise that suddenly flies around the stadium. But then nobody knew what to trust because actually... About 90 seconds after the first time that that happened, Brighton did actually score. And the whole stadium actually was probably the loudest noise I've heard at Anfield all season, more than any goal, because the whole place, it was just delirium. It was a sense of, can't believe this is actually happening. Liverpool were obviously confident that they would get the win yesterday, but I think everyone was sort of resigned to the fact that Manchester City were likely to win as well. So the fact they went behind, and I think what was it, 83 seconds of just pure joy for the Liverpool supporters, probably lasted a bit longer because they were so busy celebrating, they hadn't realised that City had equalised. Yeah, it was a pity that that equaliser happened so quickly because mm. you, for the proper drama of a final day to unfold, you definitely need a bit more jeopardy than there was. Because once it went one all, you were like, OK, well, that's that was it. That was If Brighton were going to get something from this game, it was going to be a single goal and uh, it was going to take City a while to equalise, and then it would have been a last gasp effort, but you just felt there was an inevitability about it at that stage. Yeah, Brighton needed to build some sort of a resistance after they got that goal and grow in confidence and let Duffy and Dunk start to grow into the game and feel it out and feel as though, yeah, this is the sort of day people will remember us forever for. And then you can see it after 83 seconds and like the touch from David Silva, the finish from Sergio Aguero. That's what City do. I was going to say all season long, but they haven't had to. Like That is the first time they went behind in any of these 14 matches. And they didn't panic. There wasn't a split second of nerves, of doubt, of questioning, of is it Liverpool's destiny? Maybe it's just not meant to be for us. No, they just went about it like cold-blooded killers and got their goal within 83 seconds. And I, I think there were still chances, just watching back the highlights last night, there was a free kick just before half time. There was an incident where uh, there was a back pass that the referee didn't give the decision, where maybe there were flickers that Brighton could get an equaliser and get it back to 2-2. Two, two. But generally, it seemed in that second half, it was a stroll in the park for City. Yeah, OK. Um, this is Brian Kerr speaking with Steve-O afterwards. Uh, Man City won the title, but do they face a little bit of a rebuilding job? Here's the uh, answer from Kerr. Have a look. I, as a, as a, as a, in my moments of idleness before the game today, I counted up the number of games Vincent Company's played in the last four seasons. Would you believe the total is 80, which makes it that he's averaged 20 games a season across all competitions in the last four years. Once one season he played 12 games, yeah, two seasons ago he played 12 games. So he hasn't been a major part of these victories in the last few seasons. He's been probably important as a captain. He's probably spent a lot of time in the, in the medical room and in the gym and so on and hanging about. I'm sure it's been very frustrating for him. The, the light of him scoring the goal against Leicester um, on Monday obviously was was a lot of that delight would have been driven by the frustration of not playing often enough. So... You know, Stones, Otamendi are there. Laporte has shown himself a class act. Uh, they may well add another player to that to that position. They've got Zinchenko, I think. I don't think they'll try and sell Zinchenko this year. It looked like he you was on the way out last year. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, well, I think he played the back, well, left back role very well. I mean, they won every game he's played. He's think he's played 22 games in the Premier League uh, between this year and last year, and they've won every one of them. I think he's played well. But I'm sure they'll add the squad. The question on Aguero, I mean, 
you know, I, I think two years ago the manager felt Jesus was going to be the one, Aguero was going to be the bit player, but he wasn't having that and he proved himself again that he, well, the one thing he has, he's adapted his game to what Aguero, what, sorry, Guardiola wants. Aguero has had to, had to become a chaser, a harasser, a nuisance to defenders as required by the manager. And while you're at it, just keeps scoring on 32 goals, I think, this season, 21 in the league. So I think there's certainly another couple of seasons in him. Yeah. Um, Stephen's here. How are you doing? Morning, Ger. How are you? Good, thank you. Good trip back from Brighton. Yeah, myself and Brian and Enda Cole, our uh, producer, came back on the, the flight together. Uh, so uh, just uh, maybe a post-season point was had on the way home, but that was it really. And, All right. But uh, yeah, some good good, uh, good chat with Brian anyway on the way back. And um, I think, like, it was a strange game. It, it was... Uh, I don't know if anybody, I'm sure anybody watches back the game, they'll, they'll see, like, Brighton. Actually, funny enough, after the game, we, we went into, uh, Brian gave Chris Hewton a bell, and uh, he brought us over to uh, his box over the other side of the, the, the stadium and went in there, and it was just Hewton family party, end of season. Um, got to meet his brother, Henry Hewton, who played for the Irish under-21s. All right. Back in the day, he played with, he was telling us all about, he played with Ronnie Whelan, played with Kevin Sheedy. Um, and a lovely, lovely man. But uh, it was just interesting to get that little bit of insight, seeing the family connected to the man involved in the football industry, because as we all know, it's such a cutthroat business. Yep. It's, uh, you know, and then just to see this moment, I don't know if you saw yesterday, Chris Hewton with his granddaughter out on the pitch, and it was just nice to just see the family side of, of things and just to see that there is, you know, this network behind these people working in, like, the biggest league in the world. Yeah, and, uh, I'll come back to you about that because there's, yeah. uh, there's already people in the papers going, oh, did Chris Hewton get enough out of this Brighton team? And you're like, oh, come on, like, he yeah. they've survived. Like, let's, let's see what he can do with um, another off-season and trying to build on that. But um, speaking of family on the pitch, right, um, Nathan, congratulations. You've got <laughs> over a, a million views for, for us here at Off The Ball. Does it make me any money? <laughs> who, who, who? I mean, obviously, you put, me, on, your, you put, do, on, your work, you put on your work account, didn't you? Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's uh, have a look at this. What is this, Nathan? Commentate over this. This is, uh, well, this is the highlight of the day, I think, for a lot of Liverpool fans. It was uh, Mo Salah's daughter. So Mo Salah had just been out receiving the golden boot alongside Sadio Mane. His daughter refused to go back down the tunnel, grabbed the ball, and runs half the length of the pitch and smacks it in the back of the net. And not only that, she got the big chair, like her dad, she liked the big chair. She brought the ball back again and did it another couple of times. Future star in the making. It's, great it's, uh, it's one of the more, it's one of the more um, depressing aspects of every final day is when all the players bring their kids out. And, you know, we bring our kids to football every Saturday morning and we think, oh, you know, maybe a little bit of work here. They might have a bit of talent. wonder what they could achieve. And then you watch, I think it was last season, you know, Santi Cazorla's two-year-old who can do 84 keepy uppies, a little overhead kick and smack one into the top corner from 25 yards. You're thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> there's some sort of uh, natural talent here that maybe uh, we don't quite possess. Yeah, yeah, our kids lost the genetic lottery. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you sure. think, though, Nathan, that um, f I, I was just watching some of the, 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 the last moments there at Anfield and we have to remember... Liverpool have a massive game coming up. They're playing the Champions League final. But to have that kind of a... That day where you had the supporters out, there was a big party atmosphere, that that kind of stays with the players heading into such a big game in a couple of weeks? Yeah, absolutely. And being in the mix zone afterwards, there was definitely not the despondency around Anfield because of what happened on Tuesday night against Barcelona. That changed the atmosphere of yesterday, of that final day, completely. For the supporters... For the players, there wasn't that deep devastation that you might have expected considering how Liverpool have wanted to win this title for so long. And two months ago, I think if you've asked any Liverpool supporter, a month ago even, which they would have preferred, it was the Premier League, without question. But the manner of the comeback over Barcelona and the fact that Manchester City simply didn't come, didn't give them a, a glimmer of hope throughout this, meant that actually, you know, there was a sense there's still more to go. If they finish this season as... European champions, it'll be a fair reflection of where they are because I don't think there's any question that right now Liverpool and Manchester City aren't just the top two teams in England. They're the top two teams in European football at the moment. And that's a good place for Liverpool supporters to be. And the chant, I don't know if you heard it, the chant generally was, we shall not be moved. A sense that for once, actually, 
this isn't a one-off. They're not just going to fall away quite quickly and they'll have to wait six or seven years again for another title run. That all going according to plan, they should be there, thereabouts, contending for a Premier League and contending for a Champions League next season again, which means you're not too upset. And oh, some of the moments that they've had at Anfield this season from Origi's late winner in the Derby, Mo Salah's goal against Chelsea, the own goal against Tottenham. It's been a pretty special place to be for Liverpool supporters. If you're a season ticket there, I think you've enjoyed yourself this season. Just on that point about uh, Liverpool and Manchester City being the two best teams in Europe at the moment, like it's an interesting possibility that we may have uh, the two teams at the top pulling away from the rest. I think you were describing it as La Liga, Ger, that that potential possibility. Like, Is this the nearest we've ever come to that, Nathan, in your view? Because I think the, we were talking about this on Saturday, the, the, more, the most comparable situation we've had was a 2011-2012 title race, when that was uh, a two-horse race pulling away by like 19 points from the rest of the pack. This year, it's even even bigger again and those two title races uh, are the most similar that you can pick out from the Premier League era. You'd have to think there is that chance when you just look through the money for the Champions League even this season and I hadn't realised the full extent of the increase in prize money for the Champions League. Liverpool are going to get over £100 million for their Champions League performances alone on top of whatever the £120 million they're going to get from the Premier League. Manchester City, Manchester United doubled their take from European football from last year. So definitely we're going to have an extension of the top six back to everybody else. And then within that, you would think that Manchester City and Liverpool are best positioned to kick on. The only question you would have is that like, there's not a huge amount of world-class players out there. And if you get a good manager, if you have a Maurizio Pochettino at Tottenham or whoever Manchester United in six months' time end up with as their next manager, if you get a world-class manager with a good eye for players who can develop players, I think you can make inroads pretty quickly. Jurgen Klopp has, has proven that, that if you have the scouts, if you have the network in place that you can go and buy a player for what's probably 40 million, 50 million now and bring them on to another level. You can close in. Definitely on Liverpool, it's just whether it, like, this Manchester City bandwagon could roll for years if Pep Guardiola has, has the motivation. But they're not without their weaknesses as well. They're going to have to go into the transfer market and find a replacement for Fernandinho. Is there a trust there in John Stone still? It seemed at the start of the season there was, but we heard Brian Kerr touching on it. Vincent Company came in for these battle hardened games. Yeah. Company, well, it seems, is going to leave. Well, it, so, if, it, isn't the point about Company, though, he, they'll do the same thing with John Stones. They'll, they'll allow him to have a period where he grows as a footballer and becomes better. I, I think that the best John Stones Manchester City um, version is still to be seen. And that actually, you would trust Guardiola given that instead of burning Vincent Company out the way many managers would have done, uh, they decided to keep him around, and, and lo and behold, he ends up um, being very important over these final 12 games. The way he's managed Vincent Company has been exceptional, but I'm not sure if it was that thought out. I don't know if at the start of the season, Pep Guardiola thought, you know, I'll, I'll keep him here and I'll be using him as much as he did for that title running, because it seemed as though he'd settled on Stones and Laporte, and whatever happened, Stones fell out of favour. And I think he, it was largely maybe due to, due to that game management, to that experience that that company has but the spine of that Manchester City team is going to need replacing you look through it from company to Fernandinho to David Silva to Sergio Aguero we're talking about players in their 30s that are the greatest players the club has ever had and they're going to be needing to be replaced in the next couple of years Gabriel Jesus does not look like he's ready or will ever be ready to be the next Sergio Aguero so who is that like that's a huge decision clubs falter because they can't replace Sergio Aguero's 20 goals every single season. Now, City obviously can pick pretty much anybody in world football, but it's still a slight little question mark. And they're all slight little question marks, but you, you do sense that they're so well organised at boardroom level. They're in the Manchester United Alex Ferguson position where they can strengthen from a position of strength. They're not desperately looking around. They're not going to have to let Fernandinho go. They can bring in, whether it's Rodri or whether it's Declan Rice, which doesn't look likely, but they can bring them in and give them 20 games and let Fernandinho have the 20 games as well next season. So they're in a, a, the best position of anybody in that league by a, by a country mile. But Liverpool have more work to do, but have shown that they can do it. And like, the one thing when you look back in the last couple of seasons, and we get into talking about best games, is we have a proper rivalry in the Premier League now. Up there with the Arsenal-Manchester United rivalry. Doesn't have the same characters like all of modern football. But in terms of the level they're at, in terms of the quality of their games, of, of what they mean, it's a better that's quality. Liverpool and Manchester City are. I, I think it's. No, a, it is a better. Uh, sorry, it is. It is a. It know. is a better quality. 
I, I, it, it, without question, the, fo- the quality of football right now is better than it's ever been, simply because of pure. Yeah, I, I, I just feel it's easy to forget about that Arsenal team. Like that Arsenal team under Arsene Wenger played some absolutely incredible football. And I remember at the time they used to get kind of uh, criticised for maybe taking too much out of the ball and they were trying to run the ball into the goal. But some of the football Arsenal that, that, played at that, that time. That team that was rival of Man, of Man United didn't do that. that like yeah. Perez and Henri once mm. had that thing where they screwed up the penalty and like <laughs> everybody went, oh, this is taking too far. But when at their peak, yeah. they were just... They were rapier like there was no yeah, there was no messing but around. All that fanny and around came around later. Like yeah, let, yeah. let's all, let's also not forget to, to what extent Manchester City and Liverpool are now playing football at where they are, as Nathan says, the continental leaders, and not only the standard they're playing, but in a model that is going to be copied. Like it is a copycat game. People are going to be looking at exactly what they're doing and trying to copy that. And I know Arsenal, to a certain extent, people looked at them and they followed that model as well. But this is revolutionary stuff, and it's, it's not the start of the revolution. We've seen this for the last few years. Like this is the way football ball is played now and it is in a, in a, in a decent amount uh, down to what Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola have done in the last two seasons in my view. And also yeah. the money. I mean, that's like it's the best. But, like that, that's like that, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is a better era of football than the Manchester United and Arsenal era was. We get carried away, as Nathan says, with the idea of characters. It was a, be- it was a more enjoyable era. It doesn't mean it was a better era in terms of the quality of football. Well, it was just different football. It's not to say it was lesser quality. You know, but if you look at the points tallies, I think it's pretty clear that this year's title race, in terms of a two-horse race, is a higher quality than, well, than we've is, ever is seen. That, is that well, what points tallies means, or does that mean the rest of the division, like, immediately at the start of the season, put circles around the City game and the Liverpool game, went, well, we're going to rest players, or we're not going to put our best team for that, we're not going to game plan for those ones, because we don't expect to get anything from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I actually, I looked at the, the table from the last year that United won those back-to-back titles, and I think they finished on 90 points, which is only, it's eight points off what that Man City team got yesterday. The big difference was the goals. United only scored 64 goals that season compared to Man City's 95. So, um, and I think they, they, the, the goals against United only conceded one more than City. So we, you can tell a story there. Like obviously there wasn't, wasn't big, huge hammerings in that, in that season from United to other teams. Interestingly though as well, that was 08, 09. I was remarking yesterday that that was the first season was Pep, Pep won the La Liga with Barcelona. That was 10 years ago. He won his first league title. And since then, he's won eight in 10 years, six, sorry, three in Spain, three in Germany, and two in England. Yeah. Incredible. It is good. It's great. Like, it is. It, he was at Bayern Munich, and he has had all the money in the world to build him. It's hard to get too carried away with what Pep has done mm. because there's still that... He had Messi in the best team of all time at Barcelona, mm-hmm. and then he had it's Bayern Munich. Everybody wins the league there all the time, and uh, now he's had all the money in the world. Coming yeah. to a team that was already like a title contender. I think you can you can separate them really. Look, definitely you have to talk about the money. You have to say that you know he's had every resource that he needs at that club, but then also look at some of the players that he's coached. Like Raheem Sterling has definitely improved vastly yeah. under Pep Guardiola. Heinrich Laporte, I think he's been a key man this season. I think he's maybe getting a little bit overlooked. Heinrich Laporte, I think, is part of that spine now. I think he is their key defender. Um, he contributes both in, in a defensive point or a defensive way and in an attacking way. Um, players do improve under Pep. You know, albeit he has a lot of money. He's a brilliant coach. Absolutely, yeah. clearly a brilliant coach and... and uh, has left an imprint on football which will last forever, right? But it's hard to give him the same kind of credit that you would have given, say, Alex Ferguson or um, or even Klopp in this instance, where Klopp has taken a Liverpool team who, by right, could have been the fourth best team any any year over the last four or five years, and everybody would have said, oh, they're they're now like a Champions League team year in year out. But to do what they did this season is ridiculous. Yeah, I th- it was weird. Yes, I like. I've Who's the manager <clears throat> of the year between these two? It's a good uh, question. It's uh, for like Jurgen Klopp is the manager of the year between the two of them. There's no question. He's got well, he, he's got more out of his team than Pep Guardiola. I do think we're we're com- not comparing like with like Guardiola. His skill set is working with the very elite and somehow been able to turn brilliant players. Remember Raheem Sterling in 2014 was already a brilliant player to turn him into a truly world class player to work them to the bones, to somehow get them playing in, in a system, what is, in many ways it feels, a quite rigid system, and a, and a different system this year 
to last year, the amount of work he makes them do in the training ground. Players who are on 300 grand a week and they don't moan, they just get on with it. The very elite of world football and to bring another 10% out of them. Jurgen Klopp is slightly different. He makes very good players better. He, he makes Mo Salah a good striker into a great striker. He, he's starting them at a lower level. But Guardiola is probably the only manager in, in world football who I think can get a squad of such talented players and get them playing that attractive a style of football. Yeah, it's funny. I'm, <clears throat> I've done two Man City games this season, Nathan uh, Huddersfield away, and the game yesterday. And I, you know, yesterday's game was was a really impressive performance, and you know, some of the football they played was good. But I just, I do, I admit, I come away from those matches, those Man City games, just not feeling like a, a great love for the team, not feeling a great kind of passion for what they're doing. It's, um, it's just like it's it's very impressive football. But I don't think it's that enjoyable. Like maybe it's where they are at this stage of the season. Like I think back to the games against Chelsea and Arsenal a couple of months ago. The six 0 against Chelsea was as good as I think I've ever seen of one team dominating another in the Premier League. The speed of play, Aguero's ability in front of goal. But what I do think I would go along with is the love, any love that might have been there for Guardiola and Manchester City is dwindling very quickly, and the backlash is coming next season. Mm. People are sick of them now. People are looking at them going, financial fair play, the best of everything. Who do these guys think they are? And have sort of grown used to the style of football. Last season, I think everyone enjoyed it because it was probably as good technically as we've ever seen in the Premier League. This season, we had a title race and two teams going at it week after week. And again, the games between them were unbelievably good. But now, if it's just Manchester City steamrolling everybody for a third consecutive season... I think that love that maybe he thought was there, that was there for that Barcelona team, isn't going to be there. And it'll probably quite quickly into the season, I think you'll see people going for them. Not, unfortunately, not teams on the pitch, but yeah. certainly in the media. I think yeah, that's be a problem. Of a, but, like, and bit of a reflection. But, and who cares what... Care. Exactly. And who, who cares what happens when uh, there'll be a bunch of columnists going, this is terrible, we should have done something about this. And it, it might be too late. So if, if Liverpool have a down season next year and there isn't a title race, then they'll win the league by 20 points. It'll be over by... Mm. February, let's face it, and like even if Liverpool have a slow start and finish by winning their last 30 games of the season, uh, it, that might be too late. 90 points might be not even getting you into a title race next season. So, I don't know, we, to, everybody's better be careful about how good this... Um, it was my point about the Man United fans. They definitely want Liverpool to win the league because Man no. City need to be stopped somewhere along the way. Man City are going to be here forever. I, I'm not sure. Nathan was making the exact opposite point. Where you, well, you didn't say it clearly, but like the age profile you point out, Nathan. I mean, if somebody's going to kind of dwindle next year. Are, are we need... sure Liverpool is, is the one of the, uh, is the, the, the team out of these two that that is going to happen to? I'm not so sure that's the case. I thought it was no, earlier I, in the I, year, I, but I think getting to 97 points and the way to sustain this, I thought they would tail off this season. They're still in the Champions League final. If they Mo went to the final day of the season, they got 97 points. Yeah, but if Mo they got Salah gets best injured. goalkeeper in the league. He, he won the Golden Glove. They had two of the three uh, Golden Boot uh, winners uh, yesterday. How it's many been... significant injuries did they have this year? They like So Gomez got injured, but did anybody else get injured for any long period of Gomez time? Gomez was a significant injury. Yeah, and they managed to deal with it eventually. Um, Trent Alexander-Arnold was out for a little while, and ultimately that ends up seems to have cost them significantly. Um, anybody else? The, 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 the midfielders at different times had, had a few injuries. <coughs> Obviously, Roberto Firmino has been injured at the end of the season, and Divock Origi has come in. I don't think, even though it sounds as though he's going to get a new contract, Origi will ever quite be at the level you want if Liverpool are to be one of the top two. Maybe he's just a, a nice squad player, and he's a good lad to have around the place. But it's just you look at City, they can go out and they've all the money in the world, and none of those four players that are key players, and it's going to be hard to create another David Silva, but they can do it. They can go out and buy the next David Silva, where Liverpool are going to have to take chances. They're going to have to trust Klopp yet again that he can take a very good player and turn him into a, a great player. Whereas City, because of the money, are in that position and are going to stay in that position. But there is that slight question mark of, like Sergio Aguero, what is it? Five years in a row he scored over 20 goals. At some stage, that's going to have to stop. But maybe they sign Harry Kane. What about the academy, though? I keep, you know, I didn't. Daniel, Daniel Taylor did a great piece about two or three seasons ago about how Manchester City are hoovering, hoovering up all the, yeah. the young talent in Manchester, that they've overtaken United as, you know, the academy team where young players want to go. Where are they? You know, Phil Foden's come through. 
you know, uh, you, you know and again, like he was yeah, taking that's out a, the that's team academy pretty quickly. football. That, that, that's academy football. Like Phil Foden will be the exception to the rule. The vast majority of them will end up going at Chelsea route and, and leaving the club. But yeah, you get one or two, but they've got the same amount as Liverpool have gotten away. But like this is the thing, they, they've had the none, academy. have they? They've had none. Where, 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 are, where are all these players? Well, I think it's it's too early, yeah, because that academy is like it's churning out its first mm. uh, under twenty threes now, and so maybe that first group didn't make it. But like, um, I, I think that actually that's another sign that there will be a bunch of good young players coming through, which will be a disaster for the rest of English football. So um, I think Liverpool are around for the foreseeable. Yeah, but I, I do too. Except that if there is, if they get, a, if something happens, they're more prone to a shock than Manchester City are. If Salah goes out and breaks a leg in the first day of the season, suddenly Divock Origi is your like, main replacement. What the hell happens then? Because he ain't going to score you 30 goals in all competitions next year. So if that happens, whereas if, if Aguero gets injured, they will find a way to replace him at Manchester City and they will still win all the games that they, <clears throat> that they won this year. Maybe just... Yeah, sp- well, it, it, happened, it happened this season. <clears throat> and De Bruyne missed pretty much the entire mm. season for Manchester City. Their best player last season, their most technically gifted player, they didn't probably the key to everything Guardiola wants to do. Well, it was just, it didn't upset them. Let's I, I, I the listened to... Uh, yeah, well, let's, I was actually listening to a Man City podcast going over to the game yesterday and the, there was four Man City fans sitting there talking about how Fernandinho was out and they were saying, oh, you know, we don't have that ball-winning midfielder now with Fernandinho not in the team. You're kind of thinking, well, you don't need him. You know, you're still winning games without Fernandinho on the side. But except, <laughs> except for when he was out at Christmas. Mm. And they really struggled with him at that point. And that was, that, was a, that was a real mark. Now, granted, Pep Guardiola has almost learned to cope. He learned from that period at Christmas where he realised that actually there was a solution to not having Fernandinho in your team. But at Christmas, it, let's not forget the takes were out there that Manchester City get one injury and it scuppers a supposedly deep squad. Like, we were having this conversation. Like, it, it, we did, we're not just inventing this idea so that, that Fernandinho's so injury that, and, actually... And that's who they replace this summer. That's what they, they sign somebody who will ultimately grow in to be his replacement.